Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, another one of our events of the Portuguese Beyond Border Institute, PVBI, from California State University, Fresno, our fall uh, speaker and conference series for, of course, the fall of 2021, everything uh, still through Zoom. Um, we're hoping to go back to some uh, new normality uh, in uh, during sometime during the spring to at least have a couple of events that will be live, although we will continue to do lots of uh, different events, Zoom, and even the ones we do live will probably be a hybrid version because we are able to um, get to folks uh, elsewhere, those who join us uh, from different parts of the country. We always have a good number of folks joining us, whether it be through the webinar or on social media outlets um, in, uh, in other parts of the country, Texas, uh, Arizona, Oregon, Washington State, even in the Pacific Northwest of uh, in Canada, Vancouver, British Columbia area, of course, uh, East Coast as well, and some folks in Hawaii, which, uh, of course, today's topic will be right uh, uh, up uh, in their neighborhood. Um, so, uh, but uh, for the remainder of the semester of 2021, we still have uh, a another five events, and all of them, of course, uh, will uh, be still uh, through uh, Zoom webinar. We're very excited to have um, this conversation, this uh, presentation of a book just uh, released recently. And uh, I'm going to um, uh, introduce our guest, as you can see here, uh, Donna, and I hope I say it again right, uh, Benkovitz, uh, who is um, a professor at uh, California State University uh, in um, uh, teaches history of California at uh, the California State University, Long Beach, if I'm not mistaken, and um, who is uh, an author of a new book, as I said, uh, just recently released, and I got my copy here just a couple of days ago. I highly encourage each and every one of you to do the same. Between the Sea and the Sky, the Saga of My Portuguese American Family in uh, Upcountry Maui, 1881 to 1941. Before we begin to talk a little bit about the book and a little bit about this journey, uh, if Don, if you can take a little bit of time to tell us a little bit about your just a very uh, your journey from, of course, Hawaii to California, where you um, have got a PhD from University of California, UCLA, and uh, teach history, as I said, at uh, CSU Long Beach, Long Beach State. Um, and you've authored uh, other uh, books and papers before. There's one that I actually have ordered, and I hope to get it soon, which is uh, your book, totally different subject, obviously, uh, <laughs> Federalizing the Muse, United States Arts Policy and National Endowment for the Arts from 65 to 1980. It was published by Chapel Hill University of uh, North Carolina Press in 2004, and I just ordered it uh, yesterday, and I hope to get it soon because it's a subject I'm, uh, I'm eager to learn more about. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, so I guess my journey towards all of this, I, I'm originally from Maui, from the community I'm writing about. I'm a, a fifth generation Portuguese American uh, writing about my family in this book. So uh, I actually grew up more in California. We left when I was little um, and I lived in Northern California for a number of years, went to high school there uh, and then went back to Hawaii with my family, we, we traveled back and forth a lot. My grandparents and many relatives lived there all along. So we, we traveled and visited often. Uh, and my parents always wanted to go back there. So we went uh, about the time I finished high school. So I lived in Hawaii for a number of years and I had wanted to go to university and study history. Uh, didn't do that right out of high school because of the move. Uh, so I ended up working for a while in restaurants and doing other things on Maui um, until I decided I really did want to go back to school. <laughs> so I uh, finished my kind of associate classes at, at Maui Community College while I was still working. And then I transferred to the University of California at Berkeley. So finished my undergraduate degree at Berkeley uh, and then decided to go on to graduate school and, and came down to Los Angeles, went to UCLA for the master's and PhD program. Uh, so that's where I started working on the first book. <laughs> that was uh, basically a product of my dissertation and then some additional research after I finished the dissertation because uh, I was interested in that blend of politics and culture that that, that book is about. So I had a lot of fun with that, uh, traveling around the country and doing the research, mostly in Washington, DC for, for that book. Um, However, I was always interested in immigration history <laughs> and uh, 
actually my undergraduate thesis at Cal was about Portuguese, or not Portuguese, but Polish immigrants, the other part of my background. And uh, I wanted to learn something about that. So I did my senior thesis about the Polish immigrant press. Um, and then when I went off to grad school, I thought I would continue with some immigration history and realized, you know, I didn't really want to continue studying Polish immigrants because I didn't speak Polish and I didn't really want to learn Polish. <laughs> so I ended up shifting into that, you know, the art and culture topic that, that turned into my dissertation. But, you know, I've been thinking about this story for a long time and I kind of came back around to teaching immigration history as a professor and decided now is the time to start sitting down to write this because Although it's a family history, it's certainly personal to me. It also fits in with the larger context of immigration history and, and Hawaii history and American history. Uh, and of course, Portuguese American history, right? In ways that I think are, are interesting beyond just my own family. <laughs> when you were researching, of course, and when you were uh, uh, talking to folks, I'm sure that that happened to all your family, family members, people that you know in the Hawaiian uh, Portuguese community. Um, and you know, when you decided to ta tackle this, uh, this, this book, which is, uh, it's kind of, a, of course, it's a historical book, but in a more of a, uh, a little, uh, a, bit, a little bit of fiction, you know, that you've created within the writing, which is wonderful. Um, and congratulations on your writing. And, um, when we, when, when you were basically doing the first thought process, I want to write this book, what kind of compelled you to really, uh, you know, want to write uh, about a history that's part of, you know, who you are as a person, but um, uh, it's uh, something that's really hasn't been researched a whole lot and hasn't been written about a whole lot. Exactly. And I think that was, you know, that was one of my prompts, right, to get involved in actually writing a book, um, you know, that whenever I talked about my family history and how they ended up, you know, in Hawaii from the Azores, people always found that a very interesting story. So that was certainly one of the reasons I got into it. But I also realized when I started doing some work and research myself that there wasn't much written about this. Uh, and, you know, there's not a lot written about Portuguese as an immigrant community. Um, there's even less written about Portuguese in Hawaii. There's really not very much at all. Um, and even uh, the book that came out, you know, by Jerry Williams a few years back, right, The Pursuit of Their Dreams, the Azorian uh, immigrant history in the United States. He does speak about Hawaii, but I think there's only about 10 pages in the, in the whole book that's really about Hawaii. So I felt like it was a story that, that needed more attention. Uh, and, you know, beyond just the numbers uh, and, you know, the, the overall plantation history, I think the Portuguese in particular get lost because a lot of the histories of plantation work are focused on Asian Americans uh, who are the majority after 1900. But in the late 19th century, which I start writing about, uh, Portuguese were a pretty significant number uh, of the population brought in to work in the sugar plantations. Um, and then they're also unique because they, they, many of them break away from those contracts when they're finished with their three-year contract, they go off and do their own thing and create their own communities. So there is a Portuguese presence, uh, certainly in my hometown in Hawaii uh, and in a lot of other locations that I think deserves a little more attention. Indeed. And um, you write uh, by the beginning of the book, uh, um, you, uh, and I quote, uh, there's a uh, referring to, of course, the Portuguese Americans is at once a universal saga of dreams, struggles, successes and setbacks, as well as a unique story of an important immigrant group who helped to build the industries and communities of Hawaii. Mm -hmm. uh, we talk a lot about the Portuguese in Hawaii, not enough, obviously, in the mainstream world, uh, but within maybe Portuguese American circles, there's always this kind of uh, a little bit of conversation uh, about the Portuguese in Hawaii. But it's more as is in a awe of what of where they're at, you know, because it's a beautiful place, um, and very little is known about you know this about these uh, uh, how they built these industries and these communities that were an integral part from what I read, you know, and I said as, as again I've read only the first seventy eight pages, but of the of the first seventy eight pages of the book they're an integral part they're really 
they really mainstreamed into whatever Hawaiian uh, uh, culture, you know, with all the different ethnicities and all the different uh, groups that there were at a particular time in the end of the 1900s, the beginning of the 20th century. Um, they really integrated and were a vibrant, and still are in some ways, but were a very vibrant community and had a lot of influence in some of the changes that were made, it seems like. I agree. I mean, I think that's exactly right. They came in, you know, I mean, when I originally started working on this, I thought I was going to be writing a lot about sugar plantations. And it turns out that's not really the case. Uh, that is the, you know, the, the reason many of them came was to get that contract to, you know, to go somewhere where they would have opportunity and a job uh, and housing and all of that that came with the contract. But that was very hard labor for someone else, right? And I think they had bigger goals for land ownership uh, and independence that many of them, uh, including the story of my family here, do achieve fairly quickly. Um, and I think that is, it's, you know, partly to the credit of the kingdom of Hawaii that invited them and helped them in terms of uh, homesteads and, you know, the, ab the ability to get some property. But also they, you know, they did, create their own home farms. Uh, they, you know, they sort of carved out land, uh, cheaper land up in the hills, right? Wooded areas that they, you know, they harvested the trees and they, they became lumbermen in part uh, doing that. But then once it was cleared, they became farmers and ranchers. And, and uh, the part that I ended up being surprised about was how many members of my family ended up growing pineapples. <laughs> and uh, they became very much a part of the pineapple industry selling the product of their home farms to the, the cannery. Uh, and, and many of them, of course, also working, you know, for the pineapple plantations and the cannery as well. Uh, so they're, they're very tied into sugar and to pineapple. I don't think either of those industries would have done as well without mm -hmm. them. But they're also integral to the expansion of, you know, home farms, ranches, sort of independent uh, small farms. Uh, and and as well, building the communities, you know, literally from nowhere <laughs> in Hawaii, the, the towns that I talk about are, were primarily Portuguese populations for a while. Um, they built Catholic churches all the mm -hmm. way across uh, the, the mountain uh, that are still vibrant churches today. Um, you know, they started off with Portuguese masses and Portuguese benevolent societies to help themselves out and, and their neighbors. Uh, and they became very much a part of the landscape of Hawaii. I think certainly introducing Catholicism as a as a major, you know, religious factor there that was not there before. Um, so indeed, I was going to say um, Catholicism wasn't really something that was, of course, a major religion in any shape, way, shape, or form in Hawaii. And mm -hmm. so, from building those churches and the involvement of the Portuguese from the Azores, um, you feel that it was a contribution to uh, a little bit more of a religious plurality also in the islands. I think so, you know, and I think that's another thing that uh, doesn't get talked about very much because we always talk about in the Hawaiian kingdom, right, the arrival of the missionaries, right, who were Protestant missionaries, Congregationalists. Um, and of course, that is a major uh, factor in terms of the religious history there. But um, the Portuguese did help to expand Catholicism and you know, really grow that, I think, in communities, especially outside of Honolulu at first. Mm -hmm. And that's still and, a big feature in Hawaii, right? <laughs> indeed, indeed. Yeah. And, um, and so um, your book basically, is, of course, is, is the story of your family and mm -hmm. um, and it takes them all the way from uh, from from San Miguel, some of the very first days uh, in San Miguel, in the island of, uh, of San Miguel in the Azores, one of the nine islands, and talks about the the desires to the desire to leave, to mm -hmm. to to go someplace else, to to get a better life. To um, uh, it describes a community that worked very hard, and at the end of the day, didn't have much to show for that hard labor that was intense and that was a daily occurrence it wasn't just a uh, uh, an eight to five and um, and so the um, the desire to leave the desire to to to, to go abroad um, and um, how did you how did that uh, how did that 
uh, come to you as far as writing about that a little bit, of course, because we're talking about, you know, over a hundred, way over a hundred years ago, uh, about 140 years ago, more or less. And so um, tell us, tell me a little bit how you inspired you to go back and to talk about some of these places in São Miguel, Bartanha, and some of these places that Amer Americans who are of Portuguese ancestry, whether they live in São Miguel or a Corvo or Terceira or Fayal, they will have heard of these famous uh, freguesias in, in, um, in São Miguel. So a little bit about that, how uh, not only you researched it, but, you know, what were your thought process in writing about that particular time? Okay, well, again, I think this was really looking into the family history itself. Um, we know that they arrived, uh, this particular family, the Tacostas arrived in 1883 in Hawaii. Uh, so, and the, the family story was always that the mother arrived alone with her children. Uh, so I wondered, you know, what was that story? They're, you know, they talked about him going off to work in Panama. And mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so I went back and, you know, this is the historian side of me, went back sure. to figure out sort of what was going on when and how that might have been possible. Um, and it seems very likely, right? That's exactly what happened, that he went you know, to work, not for the American version of the Panama Canal, but the earlier French construction uh, and caught yellow fever. Uh, and that was, of course, the family story uh, and died and never returned home. So the family had to, had to decide what to do. Uh, so what, what I did find in the records was that uh, one of the sons, right, a 17 year old uh, Francisco decided to take the contract and he is the one who signed on with the sugar plantation uh, in San Miguel, right? And uh, brought the family. So he would have been the contract worker. And I, I assume likely his younger brother as well. Um, so they got the passage paid by the Hawaiian government and the plantation, uh, you know, the contract for the three years to work on the plantation in Hawaii uh, and then made that trek, right? That, that uh, you know, th third of the way around the world from the Azores through the, the Straits of Magellan all the way through the Pacific uh, and to Honolulu, right? So- I, I and, you write, and you write that beautifully. I really enjoyed the, I, I felt like I traveled with them. <laughs> Thank you. With all of their, uh, with, all, with all of their tribulations. And I was just, you know, actually I put it down a couple of times and I, my wife was doing something else and I turned to her and I said, can you imagine doing this? I mean, you know, I have the same story different, much different with my grandfather who came over and then went back. And of course, I, I'm an immigrant. I, I came over to Egypt with my parents, but mm -hmm. my grandfather, who also left, uh, had just turned 18. So, you know, mm -hmm. um, and and got on a ship, you know, and went from uh, Terceira to San Miguel and from San Miguel to 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 uh, Ellis Island and from Ellis Island all the way, you know, in a, in a, in a train that he called Carro du Fugu or the fire truck. I never figured out what that was because I was <laughs> That's 10. That's a great name. <laughs> and I, yeah. Well, when I came to the United States, he always used to tell me I crossed America. He was a story. He was my storyteller. Anyway, he we we were from a group of a lot of uh, my grandparents had eight, eight daughters. And so lots of uh, people at uh, Sunday dinner and he liked to go in his own little place to, to have some peace. And so. I love to read even, and I learned to read, you know, uh, at, a, at a young age. And so he was mesmerized that I knew how to read because he didn't. And so he would tell me stories. We, we established and And so for about almost three years there until he passed on, he would tell me stories just about every Sunday. But one of the stories was the Cajo du Fugu and that, because we didn't have the concept, of course, of training the Azores, as you know. And to me, a Cajo du Fugu was a fire truck or a fire car, you know. What was it? When I got to America is when I saw, <laughs> ah, that's what Avu was talking about. But I mean, his story is the story of many others who came to California, but that journey all the way, uh, you know, that yeah. long journey to Hawaii, I mean. I thought it was fascinating. I mean, I can't imagine doing it myself, honestly, but, uh, you know. Yeah, I mean, maybe I'm, maybe on a cruise ship, but not on a, not with the conditions. <laughs> not in the steamer, right? Yeah, yeah. Their, their conditions were just really, uh, were, 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 were really, you know, very hard conditions. And it was just very, very tough for them. Yeah. Yeah, they were hard. And there was, you know, those ships that took a long time, even though they were steamers, they often often sailed as well. So the, the story for my family is it took 78 days, right, to make that passage, um, you know, and yeah, I, I just can't imagine doing that. <laughs> I think that was very strong and brave of them to, to do it. Uh, and 
to arrive in a, a totally unknown place uh, and have to start all over. Uh, that would have been, as all immigrants do, if, you know, it's a struggle to. It to is. That. It mm -hmm. is. It is. Even though they had some, you know, they had work guaranteed. They had, you know, some, 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 some conditions that probably other parts of the world didn't offer to them, exactly. uh, and that might have been what enticed some of them to go. Uh, you know, because there was something plausible there at the end when they arrived. Exactly right, and I think that was one of my original questions: is you know why would they go from the Azores all the way around to Hawaii? You know, such a similar place in many ways. Uh, you know, what would prompt that kind of a voyage uh, for basically poor people? You know, to do. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it um, surely is the plantation contracts that attracted, you know, thousands of Portuguese from the Azores to do the same thing. Uh, but I think, you know, not only that, they did have that opportunity and that, that gave them a foothold, right? But then they worked their way up, you know, to what, what their own plans and desires were. Mm -hmm. And sometimes in today's immigration standards, and I'm talking about the Portuguese American experience, which is the experience I know a little bit better. You know, we talk immigration is hard, and it was hard for my parents in 1968 when we came over. Uh, but four years later, we went back. Um, and some folks that immigrated in the 70s, you know, three, four, five years later, they went back for a visit. And, and those who came, our immigration to California practically ceased in 1881, but up to people who came in 78, 79, 80. Um, those who came in the early 60s was a, a little bit different situation, but then air travel has, of course, you know, changed immensely in the latter part of the 1970s and early 1980s. And so folks would go to the Azores every, not like every two or three years, like the, the East Coast, but here from California every six to seven years. Most of these folks never returned to their homeland. Right. Most of them never went back, never saw them, never visited anyone ever again. Um, and I think that really struck me because you know, that's, again, it's such a, a break from the past. Um, but also that you know, even Hawaii in those days, I mean, it's it's a small place. Maui's a small island. Uh, yeah. But, you know, their, their ability to go places even on the island would have been very limited. And it occurred to me that, you know, my, my great great grandmother probably never made it to the top of the mountain to see Haleakala. You know, she, I know they never really went to the ocean very much. It wasn't, it was not something that was done uh, very much in those days. Indeed. So I, you know, I just, the, the, the ability for us to move around and travel and see places is, you know, I'm sure would have been unfathomable to, to them. It was, it was. Um, as you wrote the book, and of course, uh, you know, lots of your family history is here, you know, and that's what a lot of your research is based upon. Um, any um, uh, other than, of course, the what you mentioned that uh, it's not just they worked in, you know, you thought you're going to write a lot about uh, plantations and, you know, and you did, but there were other things that happened. You'd mentioned, of course, the the uh, the Catholic Church and, and the involvement. Any other kind of surprises that hit you as you're looking at this history of the Portuguese in Hawaii at the end of the 1800s, uh, beginning of the 20th century? Um, I was fascinated, for example, that you gave us this information that, you know, uh, the uh, PDP peppers, uh, guava and figs were introduced <laughs> to Hawaii by the by the Portuguese. I, I mean, it makes sense, but I didn't know that. Yeah, Obviously. they brought things with them. I guess, you know, one of the sayings was what, what grows there grows here. And, you know, they did bring things in um, and recreated that, you know, the, the farms to produce things that they needed and they wanted. Um, and then, of course, they also blended in with with the other cultures that were there and, and started using other types of foods. And uh, I try to write a little bit about that, too. Is, you know, what do you have? What happens when you encounter you know, they're your Chinese neighbors, <laughs> and you, know, you buy cabbage from them. It's it's not the same, right? But it's different. Um, so, I think that that diversity and that blending of cultures is very interesting. But uh, you know, the Portuguese also maintained their own, right? And they they kept those traditions, including the food. I mean, I think this is part of a what becomes Hawaiian sweet bread, right? This is Portuguese sweet bread, right? <laughs> yes, and I love the recipes at the end. I love the recipes. <laughs> Yes. Uh, so, so you 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 did place a little bit of uh, of emphasis on food, and and sometimes we, you know, uh, forget how important food is in a culture, um, and we think everybody knows what you know called coves or linguisa or whatever, you know, uh, and uh, uh, just recently 
in a, in a similar conversation, someone was talking about fidosh, 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 malasadas, as it said in in in, uh, in, in uh, Hawaii, and San Miguel as well, uh, and other islands. And so, uh, and and uh, someone uh, of a distance Portuguese past said, "What is a malasada? I've never heard of it." So we kind of assume that everybody knows this uh, if we are raised with it, but. Um, what uh, what was the major reason to um, to include some of the foods and to include this wonderful picture, which I love. I don't know if the folks can see it, which is of the uh, they can buy the book to see it, uh, which is uh, the um, um, the Tavares family oven. So an outdoor oven. So tell me, first of all, a little bit about that oven and what you know about the, those stories, because you say they're still uh, yes, in different uh, parts of Hawaii. Are. Yeah. There are a few, and of course we found that in someone's backyard. We knew we knew more or less where it was, where their land was. So I was very happy to rediscover the oven, and, uh, and it still works apparently. So um, the I think the food is it's part of one of the things I wanted to highlight in my story was also the role of the women, right? Because I think we talk a lot about the male workers on the plantations, um, and that's all very true. But you know it's. It's the women who came along and brought the children and, and you know, built the households and uh, in many ways really helped establish those churches and the, and the, you know, the benevolent society work and all of that as well. Uh, and so what was going on in the home was important. And, um, you know, in the, in the old days, they had a community oven. They would, they would all go and bake their bread somewhere together, you know, in the plantation village. Later, they would build their own, right, and have their own mm -hmm. ovens uh, and their own gardens. Um, but I think, you know, the women are, are what help that community maintain those traditions, and those are those are important uh, to them. Um, my great great grandmother was also the midwife, right, and I think that's that's an important role there as well. I mean, literally birthing the the community um, one baby at a time and. Uh, they don't get a lot of credit for that sort of work. Um, mm -hmm. you know, it was sort of women's work. Um, you know, people didn't people didn't have their babies in hospitals. There really wasn't one back then, and there was a plantation doctor, but that was really just for the for the male workers. They kind of let the women take care of women's things, and uh, you know, I think they had the midwife had an important role, right? As a you know, not just the midwife, but the but the healer and. Uh, those were the days when they went and they, they would stay in someone's house and not, you know, before the baby was born, they would stay there afterwards and help take care of the mother and the children and the family for, you know, up to a week before they, they left and went on, you know, to the next job. Um, and I think in my, in the case of my great grandmother, you know, having lost her husband very young, uh, this was very important as, as labor to help keep her family going. So I wanted to highlight the women too. Yeah. Yeah, indeed, and 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 what I've read so far it does, and actually I was about ready to start chapter four, which uh, starts with like mother, like daughter. So there's a little bit of, uh, uh, I, I'm curious to get to that. Um, you used a little bit of also of Portuguese, you know, with uh, for example the title of that chapter four, Qual é a Maria tal filha cria, and so. Um, uh, were there some of these words, uh, although I'm sure, you know, the language was not a language of communication already as you were growing up, but were there some words that were still used by the family, in your case, you know, what, four generations later, um, yeah. uh, that were still used uh, in, in uh, you know, once in a while in conversation, some Portuguese words, for example, you know, uh, uh, any kind of word, uh, what is, is it? Uh, like you used the forno and you used also, for example, the, uh, uh, in the recipes, you know, some of the recipes you have, the titles of Vinhedalhos, et cetera. So were there even a, a, for you, in your generation already some words that are part of being Portuguese or being a for, part of a Portuguese in Hawaii? Yes, absolutely. And, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm fifth generation and I still remember, you know, conversations with Portuguese words thrown in all the time when I was young. Um, I mean, I never learned the language. So, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of got faded away. Um, but they spoke Portuguese for a long time in the home. I think the first generation certainly did. I'm not sure my great grandmother ever learned English. <laughs> I thought she's, um, you know, at least the first three generations really spoke Portuguese at home all the time. Um, the children, once they went to school, of course, had to speak English and started, you know, communicating both languages. But when I was looking at census records, right, following the family uh, story, 
I noticed that most of them spoke Portuguese, you know, certainly the, the first two or three generations, you know, spoke Portuguese in the home or, and did not speak English. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that was interesting. It took a while for that to dissipate. But, you know, by the time they got to my generation, that was gone, unfortunately. Sure. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. It even happens here in the mainland. Sure. Uh, third generation, fourth generation, of course. Um, do you mind reading a little bit of a passage, the, one of your favorite? Sure. I'm sure you have quite a few. I have a few myself, <laughs> but uh, and I didn't write the book, but um, of what I read so, so far, but I'd love to have you read a little bit to, to entice those of uh, following us here and on social media. Right. Thanks for all the nice comments. So whatever you'd like to share with us, and then we'll continue the conversation. I have a few more questions myself. Okay. Um, well, I'll read a little passage. This is one of my favorite parts because this is when uh, the family essentially arrives on Maui. I think we all have images of what our immigrant ancestors' arrival might have been like. Um, and this was this was one of those instances that somewhat surprised me when, <laughs> when I did the research. So uh, here we go. This is this this is the ship, um, not the main travel, but the ship from Oahu to Maui, right, arriving. So it says, many Portuguese laborers reached Maui at a pivotal point for the sugar industry and their labor contributed to its success. Between 1877 and 1888, over 11,000 Portuguese immigrants arrived in the islands. For Margarita and her children, the view from aboard the small steamer nearing Kahului Harbor encompassed Klaus Spreckel's sugar operations in their heyday of modernizing sugar mill production, railroad transport, and harbor extension. Francisco and his brothers took in the scene with awe. Look at that, Antonio pointed to the steam puffing from the locomotive, making its way towards the harbor. Is that where we'll work? He asked Francisco as his gaze settled upon the large mill building and the tall smokestack billowing clouds into the air. Perhaps it looks like the sugar mill, but we'll be in the fields to start. Maybe we'll make our way to the mill to work if we do well, Francisco replied. See, I'd like to see the machines up close and work in the thick of it all, said Antonio. But then he looked back questioningly to Francisco as the ship kept moving east. Why are we not going to the harbor? Francisco watched the industry slip behind as they continued sailing. He too wondered at this. Sandy beaches slipped past, rocky shorefronts loomed higher as their vessel moved closer to the land. And the boys watched silently as they slowed near the mouth of the gulch and anchored there. Tall rocky cliffs surrounded a small rocky beach. And then out of Maliko Bay rode two small boats to meet them. They weren't heading for the larger Spreckles Sugar Company, but farther up the mountain to the A and B plantation. Come on, all of you, cried the crewmen in Portuguese. Bring your things along. Who among you can swim? What, cried Margarita. You mean swim from here? What about the children? And I can't swim. Little ones will ride in the boats. You women can get in the boats with them in the sacks. Men will ride along or swim along or hang on. The passengers gathered their belongings and queued up, some with eyes wide as they watched the men lower their things into the rowboats that pulled alongside. Now that the ship had stopped, it bobbed up and down in the waves, salty ocean water splashing up into the rowboats that also bobbed alongside and not always in unison. The men had stacked the baggage into the boats and reached up to help the women and children. Teresa went first, over the side, down the rope ladder, and into the arms of the boatman. She sat on the bags and watched her sister, Moggy, climb over. Then they looked up to their mother. Margarita lifted her skirts and slowly made her way down the side of the heaving ship, her cheeks growing rosy as she released her billowing skirts and her modesty to grab grab the ladder tightly. In her mind, the two minute descent had stretched much longer until she too settled upon the little boat. Maria Augusta then passed her little daughter over to the crewman who put her on his back and swung over the railing. Hang on tight, he ordered. Little Maria closed her eyes and obeyed as if her life depended on it, which it did since she did not know how to swim. All the women breathed out a sigh as their group huddled together again on the little rowboat. Okay, next came the men. Many of the Portuguese men had learned to swim back in the Azores. Some had been fishermen or sailors themselves. Fewer farmers had taken to the water, but Francisco had. He climbed down into the sea, swam to the front of the rowboat and hung on to the side. Your turn, Joao, the ocean is warm here, warmer than Punta da Costa, and it'll be like a baptism before entering our new home. Don't be sacrilegious, his mother called. She looked up as the other boys followed their brother. 
Weighed down, the rowboat turned towards the shore. With several men swimming along, the waves pushing them forward, it took little time to approach the beach. At last, they had arrived on Maui. Yeah, that's a wonderful passage. I remember it quite well. Um, and sometimes folks um, may think that, and you mentioned two important parts there, uh, um, that uh, uh, at, at times folks may take for granted, which is, you know, well, they're all born in islands, so shouldn't they all swim? Uh, and as you mentioned there, the ones that were in the fishing industry, they had to fish for a living, and lots of folks, especially in the island of San Miguel, were involved in fishing. Yes, they learned how to swim, but as you pointed out there, you know, the ones who were in farming didn't take much to the water. And so people forget that it's not like it, it was a whole different world. And especially as we talked about that these people, um, our ancestors worked from um, uh, sunrise to sunsets. And it's not like, okay, well, on Saturday, we're all going to go to the beach, you know, and Saturday and Sunday is our beach day. And we're all going to learn how to swim. And we're going to take you young kids to swimming lessons. Some of the things that we take for granted today didn't happen in the Azores it didn't even happen in the Azores 60, 70 years ago, much less right. 120 or 130 or 140 years ago. And that's true in Hawaii too. I was, my mother never learned how to swim and she was four generations down. <laughs> you know, and I always thought that was funny. You know, here we lived in Hawaii, you know, we had beautiful beaches not very far away. And it was just not something that was done for a lot of the farmers. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Because people were you know, even in Hawaii, where they had a lot more opportunities, uh, but still, it's uh, farming is hard work, and it's uh, it's a it's a it's a daily occurrence, uh, and sometimes we forget about uh, um, that. Um, so um, we uh, we we have a uh, I have one one other question as far as um, uh, you, you mentioned the women. The community that was built in Hawaii, and a little bit I read uh, throughout the book, it seems like the women kind of did bring that bond together. I mean, it's just like they they were heavily involved, even if they may have not been on the front line. And that's happened in all kinds of other societies, you know, uh, uh, very patriarchal. But it seemed like the, these very strong Portuguese women uh, in your family that came over, you know, that made the decision to come over, um, also had an integral part in, in creating the church and creating some of the benevol benevolent societies, as you mentioned, the fraternal societies that we call today, um, and in creating kind of a social structure uh, that kept the Portuguese uh, traditions from cooking to uh, going to church uh, alive. Yeah, I think that's very much the case. Um, and I, that's why I wanted to write about that. I think they were very important people in the community. And I'm sure the community knew it at the time, but it's kind of lost in the historical record. They don't, they don't get as much attention. There's not very much paperwork that gives them any credit. Um, I mean, I certainly couldn't find any record of, of the midwife having, you know, delivered children because all, all the paperwork is signed by the doctors somewhere down the line. <laughs> so I felt like that was kind of missing um, something needed to be done there. But, you know, even now, you know, the women are, are still very much the people who help with the church community and the, the fairs and the festas and, the, and the, you know, the money raising for, for the school and all of that sort of material. That's, you know, the men contribute, but it's the women who, who often run the show on, on those. Sure. <laughs> yeah, indeed. And, 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 um, a little bit about the, the, the your family history, which is the history of many Portuguese Americans in um, in Hawaii, and you know lots of correlations with other immigrants to other parts uh, at that particular time, even to uh, to the to the East Coast, especially, and of course also to California in the late eighteen eighties, eighteen nineties. Lots of uh, uh, Azorians were also coming to California. Um, the um, uh, but Hawaii has something that always fascinated me, which is this mixture of cultures. Um, when Portuguese were only marrying Portuguese up until about maybe 30 years ago in California, uh, 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 I'm being a little bit facetious there uh, as far as 30 years ago, but it's something quite of unheard of, you know, 50 or 60 years ago, Hawaiians kind of mixed in, uh, or Hawaiians of Portuguese background, of Azorian ancestry, 
um, uh, mixed in with other ethnicities, with other, you know, the uh, uh, Asian uh, Hawaiians and even uh, natives, it, it seems like there was a little bit more of a, of a, of a mix early on that didn't happen in other communities until a little bit <laughs> later in, I would say, to almost the end of the 20th century in certain yeah. parts of certain communities here in the, in the mainland. Well, I think it might be a matter of generations and timing, because I think if the first generations, certainly that I'm writing about, um, did intermarry with other Portuguese. They were, they were sort of a community unto themselves, at least for that. And I think part of that was because they wanted their children to marry Catholics and the other so Catholics. It's more of a religion. Okay. <laughs> so I think that's a religious factor in part. Um, eventually they get away from that. And sure. it takes a couple generations, I think, before that really begins to happen in a way that's accepted um, because I mean, I did notice there were there were a few. There were some some Portuguese uh, who married Chinese or Hawaiians, or um, you know, uh, it it did happen. It it wasn't certainly not the majority for for a while. Um, but those first few that did that, they, I mean, they were they were brave. They were they were working outside of the tradition, and that was not always accepted at first. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it probably didn't happen here in the mainland as earlier as as it happened in Hawaii because immigration ceased basically uh, to Hawaii in, I think was the 1920s to where here we had immigration all the way into 1970s, something, right, right. You know, so, was, so you know, there was, there was that, that, that constant coming, you know, of immigrants uh, and right. you know, Hawaiians already had already mainstreamed and were already working on, you know, third and fourth generation and, you know, 40, right. 50 yeah. years ago. So right. they were there earlier. Um, and some of the I think some of the California community, some people came from Hawaii too. They went there first sure. and then came to California uh, after they got out of the plantation contracts. <laughs> that was the other thing to go somewhere else that, you know, where there was maybe more land, more opportunity again, because Hawaii is very small. Sure, <laughs> and, sure. uh, there's, yeah. a, there's a question here that's very interesting, which is from uh, our good friend, Anise Yukuhaya. And he asks that in the research, um, if you have encountered any examples of people with disabilities among immigrant Portuguese population to, of course, to, to Hawaii. Um, uh, mm. Sometimes it's something that wasn't especially talked about, uh, uh, you know, even though, you know, of course, all, folks have always had uh, disabilities in uh, as long as we've lived as, uh, as human beings on this planet. Oh, absolutely. Um, I'm not sure I've encountered too much in my research mm. discussing that, but uh, again, in my own family, I'm certainly aware of, of family members who had disabilities. There was a, a a great uncle of mine, um, you know, who was, I wouldn't call him just not physically disabled, but uh, maybe, you know, they always just called him a little slow, right, as a, as a young boy. And, you know, he spent his days mostly at home. I don't think he ever went to school because um, there really weren't any services or anything in the communities for people that um, who had problems, especially in the rural areas where they lived. Um, that was, a, but it was all taken care of in By the, the family, family. Yeah. Within, within the family structure. Yeah, basically mm -hmm. to, uh, within, within, within the family structure. How um, how important was uh, from um, the, and you incorporate quite a bit as we mentioned uh, a little while ago, the the different foods. You know, so for example, sometimes folks are probably aware that especially here in the western part of the united states there's lots of hawaiian sweet bread which is of course you know the pandos uh the the portuguese you know um and uh, the malasadas which are everywhere in hawaii uh as those of you who visited hawaii have seen you know the portuguese donuts or the malasadas which uh in modern day they've done a terrific job and 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 just you know in infusing them with all kinds of things that we never thought was there were possible you know uh, of the traditional malasada but i mean here's something like um malasadas or filos as they're called in some islands of the azores they're not uh, a, as popular for example mm -hmm. as they are in hawaii Mm -hmm. uh, you don't see many bakeries in the Azores carrying malasadas <laughs> or 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 filoge other than the traditional, you know, seasonal. Um, but mm -hmm. you know, they're in Hawaii. So, how much was uh, the food kind of an important way to maintain some cultural traditions? Being that you know, you didn't have the contact with the motherland because it was a different time, first of all, and second of all, because of the geographical distance. Yeah, I think it's 
I think that's certainly part of it, right? That people were maintaining those traditions and doing things, especially the, you know, the holiday foods and, and things like that. But um, I think this is one of the fun things about Hawaii and the different communities too, is that everybody, everybody exchanges food and there's, you know, the other cultures, you know, wanted access to, the, to that sweet bread and the malasadas and, and, you know, the other Portuguese dishes as well. So they become popularized and, you know, when they're sold at the church fair, you know, it's not just the Portuguese that are going to come and, mm -hmm. and buy it. Uh, and vice versa, right? The Portuguese, you know, start taking in other, you know, eating the chow fun and the, <laughs> the uh, you know, there's the... Uh, so teriyaki. there's been, there's been a, fusion. There's, a fusion. There is a mix, right? There is a real mix. So um, I was, I was just laughing about this with my son last week that, you know, of course, one of the one of the foods of Hawaii that everyone loves is spam, right? <laughs> and uh, of course that comes along in World War II, but uh, Nowadays, you can buy Portuguese sausage flavored spam. <laughs> Interesting you, in Hawaii. You know, okay. Yes, you can. Uh, can't find it here, but. <laughs> interesting. So it's interesting how the Portuguese sausage has made it to kind of uh, different venues that we don't see it here other than the traditional linguista here. Yeah, yeah, it's very, very popular in Hawaii for everyone. Absolutely. Indeed. There's a question here from a, a poet, Scott Edward Anderson, when he asks, Can you talk about what went into your decision? to use fictional elements describing the journey, the dialogues, of course, specific actions by the characters uh, in a work that is otherwise kind of nonfiction. Yes, um, it wasn't my original intent, <laughs> I don't think. I think it was uh, a product of two things. One is that you know, I wanted to tell a story in a really accessible way for non-historians. Um, so you know, I wanted to include what people would have experienced and felt like and and you know how they would have interacted with each other based of course on my research and and my knowledge of what those situations would have been like uh, but it was a way to enliven the story and and make it more accessible to a a, a popular audience i think um and to humanize it because i think a lot of times especially with the women it's really hard to bring in the information because it's just not there in the historical record um so there's not as much documentation to fill in, especially that early history. Uh, so I ended up making that choice, right? To blend the two. You know, we're talking about living in our, our hybrid world on, on Zoom and in person. This is kind of a hybrid book in that sense, right? Bringing together those fictional elements, but you know, it's still very much a nonfiction story. Um, you talk a little bit here when, 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 and going back to um, 1896 that you mentioned that actually in the census when you were doing your research and talking about 300 Portuguese farmers, which is, you know, it's for a small place, it's a lot of farmers already. Um, and, and, and when you talk about the, um, so uh, by 1903, and uh, uh, quoting, of course, from your book, by 1903, accounts of land acquisitions show a steady increase in Portuguese small farms, uh, small farm holdings, resulting from the Homestead Acts of uh, 1880 and 1890s. Portuguese had gained thousands of acres in small plots across the islands and were in the third place among, among the landowners behind Americans and Hawaiians. Um, how important was this process into bringing some kind of stability to the Portuguese experience in Hawaii, because when we look at Hawaii, uh, the Hawaiian community, it's a very stable community. It's very, very, of course, integrated now because it's fourth and fifth and sixth generation. But uh, but it seems everything that I've read, the very limited amount, as you said, very limited amount that there has been about the Portuguese in Hawaii and and. Uh, Dr. Eduardo Mayandi, who taught for many years at uh, uh, your alma mater of uh, UCLA, actually did some research in the Portuguese in Hawaii and was one of the very first to do it um, from the mainland uh, perspective. And so um, how important were these parcels of land, which is kind of didn't happen in many other parts, of course, of the, of the, of the mainland, for the Portuguese community to get that financial stability that they probably otherwise would have never had um, if that those two land acts didn't happen. Yeah, I think it was extremely important, you know, and I think that's, uh, you know, it's, it's a chance that many of them jumped at, right, to, to be able to access land ownership and uh, to be independent of the plantations, right, and, and make their own choices. Certainly that was one thing, um, but 
you know, they were they were able to get the homesteads or, you know, combine their, their resources to get smaller plots of land um, and built those into their own, you know, ranches oftentimes, certainly lots of cattle ranches and, uh, and horse ranches, mostly cattle for the Portuguese community um, and small farms. Those were really important, I think, for, for maintaining that Portuguese community there, because without that resource, you know, there weren't a lot of jobs. And when there were difficulties, as there were right in the Great Depression, I mean, many Portuguese left because they couldn't make a go of it. There's, you know, there's not a lot of options beyond the plantation itself. Uh, and in hard times, the plantations, you know, let people go and <laughs> stop buying their pineapples. And, you know, they had a hard time. So having the land allowed them to maintain that community, to, to pass it on to their children, um, you know, and there are still many, I think many small farms and ranches in, in Hawaii today that are still in Portuguese hands, right, from that time period. You talk a little bit in your book also about uh, what uh, is known as uh, Domingos em Família, or the, 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 the Sunday as a family day, and, uh, um, and, and the... Uh, and some of the Portuguese traditions and some of the Portuguese festas, the São João festa. Um, and so um, the sense of family uh, in, in Hawaii, in, in, in your book, right from the beginning to, uh, all the way through uh, what I've read, there is always this, this, this sense of uh, responsibility to the family uh, mm -hmm. and, and a very strong bond with, with Catholicism. Uh, is that, does that still kind of exist or does that has changed? as you've seen Hawaii from the, what you've wrote here from your family traditions of, you know, of, of uh, the 75, 80, hundred years ago to today. How do you look at that perspective? And, and I'm sure you have family in still contact with Hawaii. Yeah, I think, well, the family aspect, I think is still important. Um, you know, the Portuguese community still, there's still many families from that time, right? Generations down the line, there's the family is still an important element of that community, um, the community, right? The fact that they're part of that Portuguese community, I think is important to them. Um, the Catholic churches are still there. They're not as Portuguese as they once were. There's certainly much more of a mix there. Um, I think over the generations, that's that's fallen away a bit, um, but it depends <laughs> on the family. But, uh, you know, one of the aspects that may have contributed to that change is the, the you know, the lack of population in the Catholic schools. I mean, that's, that has changed. So um, those communities, the, the Catholic church communities are probably not as vibrant maybe as they were uh, in the earlier 20th century. Okay. But uh, I think the, the Portuguese element, the Portuguese community, the families are still, are still important. They see that as important. Mm -hmm. Indeed. And uh, I promise you we'd keep it to an hour and we're going to try to. Uh, <laughs> and so I um, I don't know if uh, I know there might be other questions, but I wanted to also ask and we've talked a little bit about the food and about your decision. And what what, what prompted the decision to actually include some recipes uh, <laughs> in, in, in the back? I mean, and, and we actually have a. Uh, a, a group of uh, writers here and in, 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 in throughout the United States called Kale Soup for the Soul, which is a mixture of, you know, of course, of readings and with a mixture of food and the gastronomical experience and how food does play an important part in, in your upbringing and who you are and, and as a cultural element. So um, you have, I believe, five, four or five different recipes. What, uh, what prompted you to, to include that on there? Okay, well, I think I, I, I wrote about some of these foods, you know, in the process of writing about the family gatherings, uh, mm -hmm. what, you know, what they would have would have made on the holidays or, you know, what people's favorite dishes were with their particularly Portuguese ingredients. Uh, so, you know, I wanted to kind of bring that into the story. And I thought, well, you know, I should just put some of these in there because not everyone has these recipes. I'm, um, I have some of these are from my family. And uh, I've, I've certainly made most of them at sometimes. Uh, so I thought that would be a nice addition just to kind of, again, include the women, include that, that sure. element. That, uh, the element. Uh, the, um, one of the uh, recipes that you have is, uh, uh, it's interesting to me, which is feijoada, which is uh, the bean stew that's on page 202. But what is the word before feijoada? Help me out with that. Uh, with uh, that we uh, called it the muil. <laughs> ah, <laughs> Okay. Uh, which is which kind is, of you know it was kind of a kind of a i don't know i'll just call it a peasant stew it was sort of you know onions garlic tomato and whatever right, right. <laughs> whatever. And, and the and the first word is pronounced again 
We called it mulhos. Mulhos. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so uh, a, 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 a um, I think I know what exactly what it is. It's a kind of a um, it's a uh, it's a mixture of uh, of uh, uh, or a way of the word molu, which means the sauce is the, that uh, that made the feijoada that brought all of all of the ingredients together. Interesting how and it's interesting how some of these words are part of it. Uh, for example, the vinhedalhos. It's not just you know you could have called it, of course. Um, a wine and garlic uh, 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 marinate, but it is still used from from what I've uh, contacted with the folks in, in Hawaii, uh, Portuguese Americans and non-Portuguese Americans who know the recipes still call it vinhedalhos. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. So those, yeah. That, it's made its way into the mainstream, it seems like. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So being tiles, yeah, the moils, the balasadas, they're, def they're definitely part of mainstream Hawaii now. Uh, Kind of like the ukulele, right? Which started as a sure. guitar. Sure, as well. sure, sure, yeah. sure, 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 uh -huh. sure. Um, one would say, I mean, that even though uh, it, it seems like all of the ethnic groups, of course, added to the flavor of Hawaii, but it seems like the Portuguese did bring, um, you know, in a in a in an in an archipelago in a chain of islands that is has a very strong Asian influence, of course, mm -hmm. uh, and the native uh, Hawaiians, which are less and less, unfortunately, the numbers were staggering that you gave there. My gosh, yes. I mean, <laughs> uh, what was it one time over 600,000 or something? And I think it went down to one time less than 80,000. Yes. Just staggering sure. how the European and of course, the uh, uh, um, uh, basically, um, and the, the 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 different uh, it happened of course throughout mainland as well the, the united states the diseases and everything else that were brought uh, from other parts of the world but when we look at hawaii and when we look at uh, the influences of the various asian cultures as you mentioned from the chinese the filipino the uh, japanese uh, other asian interests it seems like the portuguese added a particular different flavor and the Portuguese being Azorians, they were islanders. So they understood the concept of being an island, uh, an islander living in an island. And they gave it a European flavor, but um, not as European as uh, one, not as European as if one was French or English or Italian or, or, or Dutch, <laughs> because, be, and I think, uh, what's your take on that? I mean, it, it offered a, a, a contact, let's, Put it this way with a community that was different it was you know mm -hmm. certainly more european based but it wasn't a traditional european from mainland europe uh so because of the so it kind of probably might have made it i don't know i'm asking would, would that be in an, a, one way that they kind of intertwine at a much better uh rate than other communities did I think so, um, you know, partly because I think in the very early years, Portuguese were a significant number, right, for, you know, before we got to the turn of the century. Um, but also they were, you know, yes, you say, as you say, they were Europeans, but not really. And, and I think that really comes across as well, because they're seen as, I mean, they're sort of in between people, right, as we, we talk about whiteness nowadays, right, it's, uh, the Portuguese were Europeans, but they weren't really seen as the same as English or Americans, right? English or Americans were a whole nother class of Europeans, and they certainly were the controlling factor, you know, in the businesses in Hawaii. They didn't see Portuguese as equal to them. Um, and yet, you know, they treated Portuguese as, you know, a, a rung up from the Asian workers, right? So there, there was this kind of social hierarchy um, based on, on race and ethnicity. And... The Portuguese were, you know, as many Southern and Eastern Europeans were at the time, were seen as, you know, kind of this in-between working class community um, who weren't able to really make it in the same circles as the business owners, right, who were white. Uh, and it took them a while, right, to be accepted as, as essentially white Americans, right? That really doesn't happen until... You know, I'd say it's starting around the World War One period. It really doesn't totally come into play probably until World War II uh, when they're fully accepted. And uh, even the census, actually the census records very distinctly list Portuguese as Portuguese and not as Caucasians mm -hmm. <laughs> until 1940. Um, interesting. So it was interesting when I was looking at some of those records because you know I, I, there was one, I forget when it was, if it was 1920 or 
uh, that had listed family members as Caucasian and somebody had crossed that all out <laughs> and written Portuguese. <laughs> I thought, wow, that's interesting. So I think in a way, you know, as, as workers, as working class people in, in Hawaii, they were able to negotiate and work with other working class peoples in a way that the managers didn't, right? So I think they, they got along and, and interacted better, right, in that sense. There's another question. Indeed, I, I agree. There's another question. And uh, who is the target audience of this book uh, from your perspective as a writer? Um, I think I was hoping it would be for many different groups. So certainly for the Portuguese community and, and people interested in, in that history, uh, but also for people interested in Hawaii and Hawaii history. I think you know many people don't know very much um, about the communities in Hawaii. Uh, especially in the older period, I, I bring this book up to World War II. I think post World War II, we know a lot more about Hawaii and and what that area is like. But I think the early history is not that well known, and I think you know that was one of the one of the things I wanted to do with this book is illuminate that a little bit more. Uh, so I hope you know people interested in history in general <laughs> would be interested in this, um, and also people interested in immigration because that's a that's an important theme here right that immigrant experience mm -hmm. and you know that that's driving for for success and opportunity for the children and you know i think that's something we can all identify with indeed mm -hmm. well donna uh, thank you so much for spending this hour with us um the book again it is uh and i'll put it up so folks can see it between uh the sea and the sky you can order it directly from amazon uh uh amazon has everything including books it started one time with just books but now it has everything but it still does have books thank god uh and and during the pandemic i can tell you that it was it's a it's, it's a great way to to you know to, to get what we need uh, in uh, in in reading and so between um, the sea and sky and we hope to in the future uh, have donna up at fresno state and uh, for a live session um and uh, we are hoping to uh, do an event, uh, if not and for the spring of 2022, certainly for the fall of 2022, where we get maybe three or four different writers with different genres and uh, all have a something in common, which is the Portuguese background and uh, and have a little bit of a, uh, not a little bit, to have a basically a Portuguese American um, festival of, uh, of uh, uh, literary festival uh, with uh, different uh, authors. So we hope to have you up uh, for that. Um, uh, but meanwhile, also uh, Portuguese American organizations, if there's an, uh, any event going on, I'm sure that uh, it'd be a great opportunity for, uh, for Donna to speak at and to talk a little bit about the book and do a little bit of a reading. Um, as, um, as you said, I, uh, it, it, uh, I've, I'm about halfway done, not quite. Uh, and I'm enjoying the, um, the mixture of the history of the nonfiction with a little bit of fiction as far as the dialogues and everything are concerned because if it's a particular time time frame and um and 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 all of the nuances and all of the tidbits of information about a community that we don't know a whole bunch uh, about unfortunately uh, which is the portuguese presence in hawaii there's been lots of things written about it but uh, as you said not uh, a, a, an entire book um there are some older books that were done, the Portuguese in Hawaii and a couple of other things that were done. Uh, but uh, as far as mixing in a story of a family that kind of is a, um, it's sort of a, of the of story of many families, not just of yours, but it could it could fit in from the way I see it. And of course, you know the area, but it could fit in with other immigrant families. It's the Costas, but it could be the Rodriguez or the Souzas or the Borges or any other families that had this similar experience from uh, from the Azores. And so I appreciate it. Uh, one final thought that I had, and I wanted to ask you real quick, which is when people talk about the Portuguese even now that you're fourth and fifth generation. And of course you're a historian, so that's not fair to ask you that <laughs> question in relevance to everyone else who is not a historian or is not you know, in academia. But um, do you feel by your contacts with your family and friends that you have who are Portuguese background, whether uh, fully Portuguese background or 20% Portuguese background, like I know some folks in Hawaii or 25 or 50%, do they have the do they under they 
are they aware of the cultural legacy and of the strong presence of the Portuguese, of, of, of some of what you tell here? Are they aware of some of this history, first of all? And second of all, are they aware that their families came from a particular place, uh, Portugal, from the Azores Islands? Is, is there still that conscience that where they came from? The, and some of them from Madeira yeah. as well. In, in Hawaii, I think there is. I mean, people do know, you know, where their ancestors came from. Um, I think there's maybe a, been a, a renewed interest down the line with the younger generations who don't who don't have that personal experience that um, now they're interested. It's been, it's been 100 years. They you know they, it's been almost 150 years really since the, the first Portuguese arrived, and I think people are interested to know more, uh, to learn more about that. Um, they're aware probably where that their ancestors came from the Azores or maybe which island, but they probably don't know a lot more mm -hmm. about that. Mm -hmm. So there's but, a that's, mm -hmm. but that's interesting that at the end of four or five generations, you know, most cases, mm -hmm. either fourth or fifth, it is uh, it is interesting that folks still know it is from the Azores uh, or, mm -hmm. you know, it is from a particular part. And some of them, as you said, uh, uh, still know what uh, or from a data or if they know if it's from the Azores, it's from this particular island of San Miguel. So it is interesting how that obviously was a work that was done from generation to generation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think the you know, Portuguese communities were, were proud of their heritage and their past, and, you know, they wanted to maintain some of that along the way, and I think they did, I, probably more than, again, they get, they get credit for uh, in terms of people discussing the Portuguese community. They're, they often talk about, especially in Hawaii, them, you know, them blending in, them moving away from being Portuguese or, or, or not being proud of that heritage, and you know, I don't think that's true. <laughs> I think I think they are, and I think that community still does maintain some of those those ties or those connections, even if they don't really know much about the Azores themselves. Um, there certainly are people who know where they came from, um, and you know, some of the some of the community has traveled there and, and seen the islands. Sure. And, sure. You know, one of the fun things about this book actually is that I've I've kind of been contacted by distant cousins I didn't know and uh, who, who talked to me about the family and uh, some of them have been to the Azores and you know found for example the, the home that Margarita had lived in before they left I mean I just think that's fascinating that that interest has maintained over so long a period of time mm -hmm. that is fascinating that is that mm -hmm. is still alive at the end of four or five generations it's really fascinating mm -hmm. so um thank you so much again we appreciate your time uh, uh professor uh, and uh, thank you so much for writing the book and uh, hopefully uh, uh many uh will uh, read it and enjoy it as much as i'm enjoying it thank you so much we appreciate it and we'll be in touch Thanks so much for having me I thank appreciate you it. And thank you all for joining us. It was another event of the Portuguese Beyond Borders Institute, our speaker and conference series for 2021. Take care, everyone.